Welcome to the Every Night is Game Night preview series, the show where designers and publishers share their passion and answer critical questions about their Kickstarter projects. If you're on the fence about a pledge, this is the show for you. Hey, everyone, it's Game Night Preview Series, Episode 38, Dreams of Tomorrow, with Carla Kopp from Weird Giraffe Games. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night Preview Series. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. This week, we have another publisher who we are very excited to uh, get behind and get the word out about their games. You know how we roll here in Every Night is Game Night. The smaller the publisher, the more they really try to be a part of the audience and all that kind of stuff, uh, the more we get excited about what they're what they're bringing to the table. Uh, so this time we have a project called Dreams of Tomorrow, which is a clever little card game. Uh, we'll get into what that's all about in a second. We are talking about this game with Carla Kopp. She is the founder and CEO of Weird Giraffe Games, as well as the co-founder of Galactic Raptor Games with Dan Letzring. She designed some games, Super Hap Override, as, lo- as well as Stellar Leap, and the Solo Motor Fire in the Library. She is publishing this game, which is designed by Philip Falconberry. That is a long intro. I'm trying to work on my intros <laughs> uh, to properly introduce our guest. Without further ado, let me get to Carla. Carla, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. I, it's funny because I listen to a lot of podcasts and you are all over the place. It is, I finally get to like have you in person. You're all, I first heard you on, uh, Gabe Barrett's, uh, Board Game Design Lab podcast. And, and once you kind of get into one thing, it's like you see all over the place. Oh my God. <laughs> How have I missed this person all over the place? So thank you very much for appearing on our show. Mm-hmm, no problem. I'm having so much fun already. All right. And uh, the reason why Carla's having so much fun is because we have Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. We've been joking around before the call. Uh, Liz is actually going to be helping out Weird Giraffe Games at PAX Unplugged at their booths. You'll be able to meet both Carla and Liz uh, at the booth. But Liz, welcome back to the show. Actually, I shouldn't even say that because you're a part of our show now. But it's always good to be here. It's always good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So uh, before we get started, I have, maybe there are uh, some listeners out there who have not heard the many podcasts you've been on. So maybe you can talk a little bit about yourself, Carla, and how you got into gaming and how you got into Weird Draft. Okay, so yes, I am Carla from Weird Draft Games. Um, I got into gaming because after I graduated college, I had this friend um, that was in the same city as I was, and she was like, let's play a board game. And I was like, okay, I like having friends and doing social things because uh, otherwise I would just stay at home because making friends as an adult is kind of hard. Um, so she kind of introduced me to gaming, and I realized that it was a really easy way to, like, actually like socially interact with other people that didn't involve like just drinking all the time um that was really like the options of like let's meet people like some people were like let's just go hang out at bars and then other people are like okay let's play a board game and I was like I will do the board game thing because like I'm fine with drinking but like that's not the thing that I just want to do all the time You know, and, like, there's a certain scene of, like, those people that just go to bars, like, every day. So, yeah, like, board games, they were just, it made interacting with people, like, so much easier. Like, I'm I'm a really big introvert, so I don't want to, like, say, like, hey, come over, let's just talk for three hours straight to, like, someone new. Like, that sounds terrible. (laughs) But, like, if it was, like, oh, come over for three hours and we'll have this game, and if you don't want to talk, we could just play this game together, and it'll be fine. We can just be silent if you want. Mm-hmm. You know? It's it's really funny you mentioned about the introvert thing. Like, they, like people assume I'm an extrovert because I have this podcast, and I'm guesting on all these other games. I'm an introvert, too. I don't like people. <laughs> it's draining. It's, it's, it, that, I'll put it that way. I love interacting with people. It's just very draining. And, and it's nice to have that medium, right? Like That's, yeah. that's kind of what you're yeah. talking about, having that... that, that shared set of rules that shared space to be like okay we're interacting on this level i don't have to fill in the gaps there are no gaps the gaps is there is it's a game is in the gap 
So uh, yeah, yeah and, like definitely. I'm a teacher. I spend all day interacting with kids, and they need you for so many things, you know. And I love it, but all day it's like, Dr. D, hey, Dr. D, can you do this? Can you do that? <laughs> I need this. Have you graded our test yet? Hey, can I come by office hours? But it's not scheduled <laughs> office hours, so I can have a special office hour. And so by the time I get home, I'm white. But I also do want to have actual adult interactions. It's so nice just to be able to go to game night and like play with people, or in my case, like just pull a game out, like decompress a little bit. The the best ah. is when those kids. And I used to be a teacher too. The best when those kids want to spend their their lunch period with your lunch period, and it's like, oh, I want to hang out up here. <laughs> Great, <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've anyway. had to start hiding during my planning periods because kids with free periods know when I have them and they'll come by. Which is really great in a lot of ways, right? It's, it doesn't right, mean yeah. anything bad about you know my my work or my life, but mm-hmm. oof, give me some silence. Yeah, yeah so, you're like I need that silence sometimes. Like if I have like just people all the time, like like I like my job because at certain points in the day I can just be like, okay, I've had enough. I'm just gonna go to my office and shut the door, and there's not gonna be any noise for hours potentially. So are you a uh, full time at, at like Weird Giraffe and Galactic Raptor or do you have a day job and you do this other stuff on the side? Uh, I have a day job. I'm a software engineer. So, yeah, like I I have to do that for now. Maybe in a couple of years I'll be able to do full time. We'll see. It's that whole like student loan situation. I have to pay oh. for that education I got and all those kind of dumb mistakes that I made throughout the year. So. Mm-hmm. Got it. Well, here we I'm are. Paying we, we... for the past. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Student we... loans are just a lot. Like, but soon, nineteen months or less. That's right. All right. Yeah. Very good. You have the end in sight, and that's why you have this company, and that is why they're pumping out these games, and one of which we're going to talk about right now. So we are talking about Dreams of Tomorrow, which is a clever little card game uh, for one to six players, uh, somewhere around a 45-minute-ish playtime, so we're not looking at a big, heavy investment. Uh, Carla, maybe you can give us the executive summary, and then we can go into it from there. So, Dreams of Tomorrow, it's a set collection shifting rondelle game about building dreams. So in the game, each player is a dream engineer trying to save their time by sending dreams into the past. And you want to make, like, really long, connected dream sequences so that the dreamer actually remembers the dream and, like, acts on it. Um, So you make, um, you take certain dreams and add them to your dream sequence, um, but you also want them to, like, kind of make sense. Like, the games, or the dreams that I remember the best are the ones that, like, aren't just, like, random things. So um, it has a sort of set collection aspect to it as well. Okay. Uh, So we'll get into both of those things. Those are both like jargony game terms, like set collection, shifting Wandel, and gamers are like... (laughs) <laughs> some casual gamers is like we'll, we'll definitely break that down and uh because this is really uh it stands out you know and we'll tell you why it stands out in a second but I, before we get into that let's talk let's get into the little bit of the history the theme wasn't always dreams so uh maybe you could talk a little bit about how the game came to you and how it's changed and uh, how it got to its current form so when i was first uh playing it it was uh originally actually a dice game called totemic rights so uh it was designed by uh, Falcon, who is Philip Perry. That's his real name, but he likes Falcon. Um, so uh, I first met him at Atlanta Game Fest, and he was pitching me, or well, he wasn't pitching the game. I was just playing it, and it was all about building up a totem pole. Okay. Um, he eventually took out the dice and added in the shifting Randell part of it. Um, but so totem poles. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let's talk totem poles. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that. I was really excited about it because uh, one of my friends, Sarah Reed, she's a great designer. She had made this game, Oaxaca, which is, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. It's a town in Mexico, and it was, uh, Oaxaca is a game about creating uh, crafts. The X is an H. So I think of it like that, like Oaxaca. Yes, that. Like, you would think that I'd be able to say that. I've heard it said a lot, but, like, sometimes my brain doesn't, like, like, I hear it, but I can't say that word. I don't know. Anyway, it's a good game, and one of the things they did in their Kickstarter was that you could get this really special box, and you could get these handicrafts from Mexico so that people, like, from Oaxaca um, could actually benefit from the game. And I was like... I really, really want to do that. I want to 
um, meet some Native Americans and have them, like, be part of it. I want to get a Native American illustrator and, like, have somebody that is actually knows what they're doing and will get money from this game and then, like, also sell, like, handicrafts or, like, something so that they can really benefit from this. Um, but, uh, the whole totem pole thing, um, it's kind of a, a sacred thing. Uh, they do not want, um, other people, like, like, making a game about totem poles was offensive to them. And, um, yeah, so there's only certain, uh, Native American tribes that actually make totem poles. I think they're mainly on the, uh, what, do I know directions? It's, like, west. It's, like, in Alaska. The, well, the Pacific Northwest is yeah. kind of that zone where it's the, it's the only place where totem poles exist, and they don't exist among all those tribes there. Uh, we learned all this because of another game that is making a similar mistake that is causing a little bit of furor. Uh, you, you probably made a smart decision to just kind of take a left turn from all that entirely. Yeah, yeah. So I saw that game, and I was like, like I saw all the um, like different like feedbacks from it, and I was like, whoa, I'm so glad I made a switch with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, I did not, like, because, like, sure, it, it's probably a good game, but, like, all this bad press for, like, what, like, what reason? Um, so, right. and the thing that you did that was smart, though, was you asked. I mean, this was all avoided because you bothered to ask the people for whom this was a big deal. And mm-hmm. I think that that's, that's important. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I went out and I reached out to the community and was like, hey, somebody, I want you to help me out. And they're like, oh, you, I will not help you out because it's offensive. And I was like, why is that? And then I got all these explanations and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. Because um, I had asked a couple of different people at the same time. And I then, like, yeah, I got the feedback. And I was like, oh, okay, I've gotten... Uh, like, it was like three different people around the same time were like, this is offensive. And I was like... Yep, if three, everyone I've reached out to doesn't reach back out to me, then that is a definite sign. Um, But, like, you know, themes. You can just change a theme. And when I was thinking of different themes, like, once I actually got into the whole dreams thing, like, it just seemed to make even more sense than the the totem poles. Um, Like, um, so with the shifting rondelle, whenever you go onto a certain space you give things to others. And with the totem poles, it was like, why are we giving things to other people? I don't know. That's like in the game. But like with the dream theme, it's like, oh, you're in a shared space. So like everything you do in the shared space affects other people. And I think that makes more sense than the Mm -hmm. dream. So let's definitely set the scene, like like you said before, you use these kind of two gamer terms. Uh, So the first part is a set collection. And basically the set collection is you start um, with a market of dreams. So it's like a central market on the board and it has a couple of dreams mm-hmm. there. And that's kind of where the visual pop of the game has come from. As you, if you're just walking by the table, you're going to see these cards and they're all pretty. It's like, ooh, what's that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I guess that's where the kind of the draw comes in. Um, so then you're going to be acquiring these dreams into your central area in various ways. Uh, and then the dreams in front of you will give you access to these powers. And then you can kind of either keep them for the power or quote unquote weave them, which is basically set them aside on a score pile, which is what you were talking about with like the string of dreams, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's a set collection. So this is like this two step process you buy from the central market. Um, that's kind of the, like me and Liz were talking about this. Like a lot of games do that, right? What sets this game apart is the Rondo. I get very excited about rondelles because when I think about <laughs> rondelles, I think about pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. I could see Dreams that because they're all the slices. <laughs> yes, the, you, you, uh, it's basic. It's eight cards, four sections, so it's eight pieces. Pizzas have eight slices, right? <laughs> so, yeah. like, let's 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 because this is what I think. This is what sets the game apart. Liz, is that is that kind of where where you land? Also, like, that's what sets the game apart. Yeah, for me, the most exciting thing is that rondelle because. Basically, in order to acquire different resources, take actions to either catch a new dream for your dream supply or, you know, weave a dream or take one of the sweet, sweet actions that is on one of the dreams that you have. You have to be able to land on that space. And so the rondelle is not a fixed rondelle. 
once you get cool dream actions, you can actually manipulate it. So you can flip cards, reorder cards, move things to your advantage, and also move things to other people's disadvantage. So it's not only that you are, you know, just it's not just like, oh, okay, let me collect a resource and see if I can be the first one to collect this number of resources. You can actively try to make that happen by saying, oh, this person could land here next turn, except they can't because I'm playing this action. <laughs> <laughs> So what Melissa is talking about is you're actually – so if you talk, if you imagine pizza pie and you imagine your piece going on these eight different slices, you can change the position of the slices. So if you're – the person is about to land somewhere and they're about to acquire a car that you know they want, you could say, no, you're not, and put that, that place where they're going to acquire a car. So like it's a, a space that says, you know, uh, acquire or whatever, whatever the, ter- the game term is. You can take that piece and just put it out of their reach or make it so that they have to spend extra resources in order to reach that space. And – Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, like, and I, I like you, Carla, you were talking about what the theme, like everybody's on the same rondelle, like everybody's on the same space. So like, it's like they're kind of jockeying. So you kind of imagine, like you always imagine the, these movies and, you know, fiction, all that kind of stuff. Everybody talks about like dreams as a consciousness and we're all like in uh, this ethereal space kind of jockeying for position and, you know, trying the best that we kind of make sense of what is out there. And the quote unquote making sense part is actually taking your dreams and putting them into your personal space. I kind of also imagine it as like people, you know, who are all in the same office, like scientists or something, you know, because you're a dream engineer, you're competing to be the best engineer as well. So it's like, oh, I'm sorry, did you need that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, look darn. (laughs) So in a lot of my games, like, you can't, like, actively hurt somebody, but you can, like, kind of, like, passively, like, oh, I was doing this for me. I wasn't doing it because I knew you wanted to go there. I, I wanted to go there. I wanted to do this. <laughs> so you can you can share spaces in this, Rondo, right? Yep. Okay, so it's not that mean. Like, the meanest games, you're stealing spaces. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's yeah. really mean. So yeah. I, I, in terms of how this game feels, would you say that it's more, like, mischievous than mean, that kind of thing? Oh, definitely. Like, I do not like mean games. So I try to, like, prevent that from, like, even happening. Like, you can't steal anything. You can just put it, like, a little further out of their reach. And um, so in the game, like, you can go one to three spaces for free, but you can go um, four to six spaces for additional resources. So, like, they'll most likely still be able to get there. They just have to use their resources. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you can make people burn through extra stuff to go their max distance. Yeah, and it's not like they can't go anywhere. Like, just just because they had their heart set in that space and it's now gone, they can... Another space is there, so you can kind of do what works. So it's not that mean a game. I think, uh, just in general, what you're getting a sense from Carl is that weird giraffe games, you're not getting, you know, munchkin or something like that. Yeah, um, there's, like, no. take that is not my thing. So then, but what you are getting with a weird giraffe game, and this is very, like... um it's it's very relevant for our audience because we have a lot of players, fans of Solo, uh, a lot of you know Kickstarter backers and everything. And Weird Giraffe games always have not only do they have a solo mode, a solo mode. They tend to have like multiple solo modes, and they're all crafted by you. Which is uh, Liz was telling me you're not a huge solo player, so I was wondering how you got into that. <laughs> So I realized that there was uh, this audience for it. Um, in my first game, I ran a Kickstarter for Super Hack Override, and that doesn't have a solo mode. And somebody was like, hey, can you make a solo mode for this? And that um, got me thinking. Out, like, before somebody asked about it, I was like, like, if you had asked me about solo, I was like, oh, that exists? Oh, <laughs> like... <laughs> I mean, it was just not something... Because I use it for social interaction. I don't... Like, if I want to play a game alone, I'll just play a video game or something. So it got me thinking about this. Um, So in Stellar Leap, I was just like, okay, I am going to try and just see if I can make this happen. So I talked to uh, different different people, um, notably uh, David Wiley. He helped out a lot. He's Cardboard Clash. Um, and I just, like, talked to him about what a solo mode is and what a good solo mode um, does, and I was like, okay, I'll take on this challenge of creating this solo mode. And, uh, well, also, part of my background is that I have a master's degree in robotics, okay? Mm. I like robots, and I like thinking about robots. We're on a video call. Uh, You just did this robot thing with your hands. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, so everyone listening 
doesn't get to you, like see me talk with my hands. Like I don't know. I I do that for whatever reason, especially when I'm like on um I don't know video calls. That is hilarious. Whatever robots. So um, <laughs> I really like um like I don't actually use my degree at uh, work, but like I felt like this is kind of like I I know like how robots think a little. Um, so I was like, okay, what would a robot player do? And it's just a, a really different sort of design challenge that I really like to take on because, uh, one, is super fun. Like, I don't need to get a playtest group. I can just make the, so- make the solo mode, and then I can just play it right there. It's, like, so easy versus, like, calling people, like, figuring out when they can come over and, like, playtesting that way. Like, I don't know. I don't want to come off as, like, oh, I hate people, but, like, being able to do something, like, completely on my own is really cool. Um, so, like, I I made this solo mode for Stellar Leap, and then I was like, oh, you know, I made one robot. I can make it slightly harder and then slightly harder, and then what if we just try it against two robots at the same time? Oh, that just works. That's cool. So, like, the solo modes for me, they just tend to work. I don't know if I just, like, spent so much time in school just on robots, um, but one thing that David really emphasized was to make, like, a solo mode easy. Like, you don't want to be, like, dealing with it a lot, but you want to emphasize, like, what the player interaction is. So, like, when I start with the solo mode, I'm just like, okay, how do players interact with me? Okay, how do I make that happen in a very short time frame? Mm-hmm. Uh, so how does that work in Dreams of Tomorrow? How does the bot work there? So in there, um, you do have a, like, robot player. They have their own card. Um, Depending on the robot player, they can move a certain number of spaces. Um, So uh, another thing about Dreams of Tomorrow, every time somebody else lands on a spot, you have the chance of getting resources. So the robot could just simply give you resources based on the card that you're using. Um, The card is basically a, like, if this, then that. Like, it's really easy to figure out you just like read it like if this is true okay do the true statement if it's false like keep following um and then it has like um it wants to shift around the roundel so it tries to go to those spots that shift around the roundel and how you decide how it shifts around the roundel is you just flip over a card in the deck and you look at it and then you look at the card and you just follow the instructions on it so it gives you resources, it shifts things around, but it can also clear out the dreams, which is an option that players have as well. So it does everything that a player would, but it's just really fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one uh, thing I definitely yeah. noticed about Weird Giraffe solo modes is that the upkeep is so easy, which is something that I really appreciate. I mean, you really just pick up the card, read it, do a quick action, and then you get to back to the most important part in solo game, which is you. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's totally true that's but yeah true. so far in my experiences of dreams tomorrow i haven't um i have been you know starting to kind of get in the groove of playing it is that the robot player i mean occasionally it'll do something that's like not too bad like giving you resources is good but it's constantly changing up your plans and making it harder for you to achieve what you want which is exactly you know what it should be doing so it's it's exciting. And then also like as the robots get harder, like you have the easy one, the medium and the hard, the you know, the robot gets more and more disruptive the harder level you play on. All right. So that was Dreams of Tomorrow. Uh clever, like I said, you know, I came out saying clever little card game. I look at it and just the, the rondelle. Uh you're here for the rondelle. Uh you're here for, you know, the the, the kind of mischievous take on set collection and everything. Uh and you're here for a really pretty production and you're here uh for a designer who knows her solo modes, who knows how to design bots and everything. So it's a nice little package for you. Um Carla, the project will be live as we drop the episode. Is there anything else you want to share about the project or anything else about the game? So if you're interested in learning more about it, I have a website. It's weirddraftgames.com, and we have info and art and stuff. There will be a ton of information on the Kickstarter. If you have any questions or comments, like feel free to reach out on, um, to me on Twitter. I'm weirddrafts on Twitter, and you can also just email me. I'm contact at, at weirddraftgames.com.
Also, solo players, if you want to see a video, I will have one out around when the Kickstarter drops. Absolutely, Liz. Has you covered? I always have solo gamers covered. I've got y'all's backs. All right. So good luck on the project, Carla. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. Liz, thanks for helping out. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Happy gaming. All right, that's going to do it for another episode of the Every 90s Game Night Preview Series. Once again, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you to Carla and Liz for a lot of laughs. Uh, Even if you don't like the games, I know that fewer people listen to the preview series overall than the regular episodes. It's focused on one game. You might not be interested in it. Uh, We invite all sorts of folks to listen just to hear some folks, you know, Uh, hang out, have a good time, who are passionate about games. A conversation like this, (laughs) listening to it here and editing, and we just have a good time. So I really hope that you enjoy it, whether you um, think that Dreams of Tomorrow is a good fit for your collection or not. So please reach out to us if you want to talk about this or anything else. uh, ENGN underscore podcast on the Twitter. We have our Facebook group, which is Every Night is Game Night. Go ahead and hit us up. We have active mods ready to swoop you up. Uh, accept your invite whenever we see it. Um, you have our geek list. You can go over to Board Game Geek. Look for Every Night is Game Night on the geek list, and you can see all of our episodes. You will see a lot of episodes posted for the next month or so. Yes, uh, this is posting in the middle of October. I'm currently on paternity leave <laughs> from the podcast. I'll have a little squealing baby uh the little gamer hopefully my daughter isn't quite the gamer just yet so i'm hoping to get it right with this one <laughs> who knows um so but i will still be around you know pokemon it just won't be as active as usual uh and when i get back to doing the podcast full swing then absolutely you know please i will try to respond as quickly as i can uh go ahead and rate us uh go to itunes soundcloud stitcher wherever you listen to the show give us five stars or however many stars you think we deserve So thank you so much for listening. I know I thank you guys a lot. I'm going to thank you again. So this is Jason signing off. Later, everybody.